Hello, I'm Sophie Ikenya. Welcome to Focus on Africa, our top stories. As the authorities in Algeria confirm the country's first case of the coronavirus, how prepared is the continent? We'll speak to the head of the WHO for Africa, who says the window of opportunity for the continent to be prepared is closing. Tensions in South Sudan's government, the wife of Vice President Riek Machar, tells the BBC he still feels restricted. You, you cannot have that clout uh, over uh, somebody. Definitely, as a person, uh, he, he, he feels he's, he's a prisoner. A military funeral is held in Egypt's capital Cairo for former President Hosni Mubarak, who died on Tuesday, aged 91. Also in the program, Costing the Earth. We find out how disease is pushing up the price of tomatoes in markets in East Africa and why farmers are fearing the worst. I woke up one morning, go to the farm and bang, about 70% of the crop is done. And in sports, there are two final matches in the last 16 of the Champions League today as Manchester City take on Real Madrid in Spain. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. And there's been another case of the coronavirus in Africa. Algeria has confirmed its first case of COVID-19, as it's now being called. The announcement comes as the head of the World Health Organization said the rise in cases around the world is deeply concerning, but also said the virus can still be contained and does not amount to a pandemic. Now, in Algeria, the health ministry said on Tuesday that an Italian man who arrived in the country on February 17th had tested positive for the virus. Earlier this month, Egypt recorded a case that mean uh, that man has now been uh, has now recovered. So far, there has been no reported cases in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, according to the WHO, there are more than 80,000 cases worldwide, and more are now being diagnosed outside China than inside. Now, the head of the World Health Organization for Africa, Dr. Masidisho Moeti, said all countries must trump up their preparedness to deal with the virus, but that window is closing. Well, Dr. Moeti joins us now from uh, Brazzaville. Thanks for taking time uh, to talk to us. What exactly do you mean by that, by that window is closing exactly? What we observe is that, as you said, uh, that this virus is spreading to more and more countries uh, outside of China. And we have seen quite rapid spread in a number of countries in Iran, for example, and in Italy. And we have now two countries that are directly affected on the African continent, although they are not in sub-Saharan Africa or in what we call, uh, in fact, one of these countries is now in our WHO Africa region. So... We've been working very hard with ministries of health, other partners and governments over the last uh, few weeks, couple of months, in order to show up their preparedness. What I can say is that uh, in the tragedy, that is the Ebola outbreak in the DRC, has been an opportunity for many African countries because they have been working for the last year and a half in improving their preparedness to deal with that outbreak. So, for example, we've seen areas like point of entry screening had been already activated. We are needing now to make them more specific for this, uh, for this virus. Uh, but we are still having to accelerate in other areas, in, in the case management of people who are ill with this illness, for example, in infection prevention and control to make sure that uh, hospitals, clinics, health facilities have the necessary equipment and supplies to protect health workers from getting infected. Those are some of the areas which need to accelerate. Mm. So, well, Yeah, so mm -hmm. let, let me step in here because there are countries like Kenya, for instance, uh, that is asking uh, passengers who are coming from China to self-quarantine. Is this effective, do you think? I think we have to learn from this experience and countries are having to weigh up several options. Uh, some might consider and some countries are implementing quarantining of travelers. The consideration to take into place is 
the resources that are available, the facilities that are available for putting into quarantine large numbers of people. And there is also the issue of the right of people to travel and human rights and to arrive at a balanced approach targeting those most likely to be infected and to infect others as mm. opposed to carrying out large uh, quarantining measures. There is a discussion taking place in WHO currently with a, an expert group to refine the guidelines on this matter. Mm. And what we have seen is that countries are developing their local um, quarantining policies while we refine what we are recommending as WHO. Mm. There's one scientist in the United States who said the coronavirus is likely to affect or infect about between 40 to 70 percent of people across the world. Is this a possibility, do you think? I will not hazard to, to make a, a quantified estimation. What we are seeing that this, this coronavirus is highly transmissible. The, the rate of spread in China, what we've seen is quite exponential or has been exponential. Luckily, we're starting to see now a reduction in the number of cases that are confirmed daily in China. But it, it, it is a, an organism that is able to spread very fast, is what we have to be prepared for in all parts of the world. All right, Dr. Mashidi So Mueti, thank you very much indeed for taking time to talk to us on Focus in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Now, doubts are emerging in South Sudan following the formation of the new government between President Salva Kiir and former rebel leader Rick Macha, who is now first vice president. Travel and public speaking restrictions had been placed on Mr. Macha. They should have now been lifted, but in an exclusive interview with the BBC, Angelina Tenney, one of the country's most influential politicians and the wife of Mr. Macha, says he still feels like a prisoner. Catherine Biaruhanga has this report. Years of war and failed peace deals have taken a toll on this young nation. A quarter of South Sudan's population is displaced, either within the country or abroad. A recent decision by politicians to form a power-sharing government could finally bring peace. At the weekend, the main opposition leader, Riek Machar, was sworn in as first vice president, as his rival, President Salva Kiir, looked on. A key test for any peace agreement will be whether people living in protection sites like this one feel safe enough to go back home. And right now, many of them are telling us they don't think it's time yet. In a church at this civilian protection site for the displaced in Juba, there's another celebration for a new leader. Riel Gatluak is being inaugurated as chairperson for a youth association. And from one leader to another, this is his plea. What we can say is that South Sudan is in your hands, not our hands. We're still young. We're the youth. We want to change things for the better based on what we see from you. Good to see you. But it seems there are already tensions within the new government. Ms. Angelina Ten is one of South Sudan's most influential leaders. She stood by her husband, Rek Mashar, when he took his oath of office on Saturday. She tells me the first vice president is still under restrictions by the regional body IGAD, which puts limitations on his ability to do his job. You, you cannot have that clout uh, over uh, somebody. Definitely, as a person, uh, he, he, he feels he's, he's a prisoner. Literally, he's a prisoner. Remember, he used to come from Khartoum. If he didn't come with the first vice president of the sovereign council, he doesn't come. He travels together. The only first time ever that he had actually stayed alone in South Sudan now, and you know, you could say literally handed over to, to, to the government and to the, the, the security of the government, is uh, starting from Thursday. Do you think it's a necessary price in order to have this peace deal that, you know, he has to remain contained, the president has to feel that he's not going to threaten the country's stability. And so the best thing to do is to still maintain these controls until there is some room for the peace deal to actually take effect. To assume 
that he is a threat to the, con to the security of this country is not fair. When he came out from South Africa, this peace process moved forward. Before he came out, there was a stalemate. We could not move anywhere. This, it is important to recognize this, this big compromise of surrendering our security to a government and a forces that have bombarded us for 40 days moving out of this country. But the president's side sees things differently. They have assured Mashar and his allies they will be protected and said the first vice president is free to travel and speak. He was restricted because the region wants him to implement the agreement in which he is a signatory. Apart from that, I don't think there is anybody who will continue to block the first vice president of another country from movement. This is probably what Riel and his friends feared. More disagreements almost as soon as the new government is formed. And there might be more to come as the opposing sides try to figure out how to share power. Catherine Biarahanga, BBC News, Juba. Let's take a quick look now at other stories making headlines across Africa. Close to 4 million Zimbabwean children need urgent food assistance as a result of severe drought and an economic crisis. According to the charity Save the Children, many are going hungry and without a major international response, children's lives could be lost. Zimbabwe's food emergency has been compounded by high inflation and a persistent rise in the costs of basic goods and services. Ethiopia says it will not take part in what was expected to be the final round of talks with Egypt and Sudan about a giant dam it is building on the River Nile. Officials said they needed more time to consult with local partners. Egypt fears the $4 billion dam will deprive its population of water. The three countries said last month that they could sign an agreement by the end of February. Now, the Chancellor of the University of Nairobi has apologized for a memo that caused outcry among students. The memo signed by the head of the security appears to blame female students' behavior for incidents of sexual harassment and even rape. The memo said that it was recklessness that led to the rape of three female students last year. Ferdinando Mundi reports from Nairobi. The memo signed by the University of Nairobi's head of security noted the rising cases of robbery and rape of university students at various black spots close to the campus or around the city. However, it went on to suggest that the three cases of rape recorded last year were a case of recklessness on the part of the victims. It even described one incident where a student was gang raped on her way back to campus from partying in the city, describing her as drunk. Now, the university's chancellor, Professor Stephen Kiama, wrote a swift apology and said the memo was insensitive and did not represent the values of the university. However, critics are wondering why the memo did not address the cases of sexual assault or what was being done to combat insecurity. Ferdinando Mondi reporting there. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Still to come in sport, we hear from the father who's mourning the loss of his son, a promising young Nigerian footballer who was killed over the weekend. I'm Sophie Ikenye and you're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The top stories on this program, as Algeria reports its first case of coronavirus, the head of the WHO for Africa has told this show that the continent needs to repeat the lessons learned from its handling of the Ebola crisis if it's to stop the spread of this new threat. Now, tensions are emerging in South Sudan's new government as the wife of the former rebel leader and now Vice President Riek Machar says restrictions on his freedom of movement still haven't been lifted. A military funeral has been held in Egypt for former President Hosni Mubarak, who died on Tuesday, aged 91. The ceremony took place amidst tight security in the capital, Cairo, and the government has declared three days of national mourning. Mubarak was forced out of office in 2011 after 30 years in power. Salina Bill reports from Cairo. An honorable farewell for a man who has long divided Egyptians. 
Hosni Mubarak, Egypt's longest serving president, was laid to rest in a military funeral. The country's current military strongman, Abdel Fattah al Sisi, attended, and three days of mourning have been announced. At the funeral scene, we met dozens of Mubarak's supporters. I love everything about him. He is a father and a leader who kept Egypt's dignity, safety and security. But this is just one point of view. Many young Egyptians who took part in the 2011 revolution that ousted Mr. Mubarak from power see him as a corrupt dictator who abused his power and violated basic human rights. Mubarak got a full recognition from the state, although he was convicted of corruption charges following his removal from office. But he belongs to the army, an institution that has been dominating political life for decades. For 30 years, he was seen as an untouchable leader who enjoyed the backing of the West. But this has all changed in 2011. Initially convicted of complicity in the killing of hundreds of protesters, Mubarak was later acquitted. Bereaved families would be disheartened today to see the man whom they hold responsible for killing their loved ones being given a hero's farewell. On this day, we have to remember the martyrs of the revolution. Mubarak is at least politically responsible for the loss of their lives. I didn't expect at all a funeral on such a scale. Mubarak's treatment sharply contrasts to that of Mohamed Morsi, Egypt's only civilian president who took office in 2012. He died in the dock, buried overnight, with only a few of his family members in attendance. Mubarak is gone now, but controversy around his legacy will continue for some time. Sally Nabil, BBC News, Cairo. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. Let's find out what's happening in the wireless port. Mimi. Thanks, Sophie. We start in the Champions League. The final two matches of the last 16 are kicking off in just over two hours' time. Lyon hosts Juventus, but the big tie is taking place in Spain, where Manchester City have travelled to face Real Madrid. It will be City's first Champions League match since they were told that they will be banned from the tournament for the next two seasons due to breaking UEFA's financial fair play rules. The Court of Arbitration for Sport confirmed today that it had received an appeal from City, but for now, Pep Guardiola is focusing on their game. We play with the, the king of this competition, so we know the, the challenge in front of us we have to face, but uh, in the same time, it's not the last one. So when you are going to die and after there's no more chances, but in life, if you are in this business, you want to train, you want to play, always, you never know what's going to happen. So that is another opportunity. We try to to follow what we thought, we we prepare and two games, the first one, and try to... You know, like David said, be ourselves and do a good game. All right. The Nigerian football community was thrown into a state of shock over the weekend as a league footballer was killed in Shagamu, Ogun State, southwest Nigeria. As protests and social media make claims of police brutality, BBC's Janine Anthony in Lagos with more on the story. The news of the death of footballer Kazim Tiamiu last Saturday has rocked Nigeria. The defender who played for Remo Stars FC, a club in the second division, was killed in an apparent hit and run, but his club insists that he died as a result of police brutality as he was in the custody of highway officers. The Deputy Inspector General of Police has said that the officer involved has been arrested and investigation is ongoing, but the family of the deceased are crying out for justice as they said the young defender had dreams of playing in Europe. I'm a father to the deceased uh, footballer. He got a, a letter for trial in uh, Sweden in which we are pursuing. We, we, the, the process is on. I want justice to be done. Now my son has died and he has promised me a lot in which he, he has been doing. He, he didn't rest until his point of death. 
Now, the fallout of his death has seen a wide range of protests by youth in his community as they call to the end of police brutality in Nigeria, while the sports minister has appealed to the Inspector General of Police to ensure the safety and security of sportsmen and women in Nigeria. Okay, let's take a quick look at some other stories making headlines. South Africa's men's cricket team will be hoping to clinch the T20 series in their last game. Their match against Australia is underway in Cape Town. And Moroccan champions Widad Casablanca have appointed Spaniard Juan Carlos Garrido as the club's new head coach on a six-month deal. The 51-year-old replaces Frenchman Sébastien Desabre, who parted company with Widad by mutual consent on Tuesday. The former Uganda boss left less than two months after taking charge following a poor run of results. That's all the sport. Sophie. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. Now, tomato prices in Kenya have skyrocketed in recent weeks, with some parts of the country paying up to seven times more for what's a basic staple for many households. It's down to diseases such as tomato blight, which have been exacerbated by the heavy rains that hit the region at the end of last year. Masijuma reports from Laikipia County in the Rift Valley, the center of Kenya's tomato production. Spreading from one crop to the next and one farm to the other, the tomato blight, a fungal disease that strikes tomatoes and is made worse by wet, rainy weather, has become a great pain to tomato farmers across East Africa. I woke up one morning, go to the farm, and bang, about 70% of the crop is done. I've, 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 I've put my investment there. I was almost going to the market. So you can imagine losing that, all of, it, all, all of that in, in, one, in one night. Laikipia County is the core of tomato farming in Kenya. Unexpected rains towards the end of last year, which have continued into February, have seen very little fruit, if at all, make it out of the farms into the market. Thousands of kilograms of tomatoes lie in waste in the farms, unfit for consumption. This is an expansive tomato farm. There are thousands of tomato trees planted here, but almost every single fruit is black and rotten. This is how they look like. And they do smell pretty bad. In major cities like Nairobi and Mombasa, the economic repercussions are enormous. A few weeks ago, one tomato was about five US cents in Nairobi. Today, that same tomato sells for around 25 to 35 US cents. As a result of global warming, we are beginning to see more extreme temperatures in the region, like the floods that were experienced during the October to December rains. So the resulting of the flood is that plants like tomatoes that do not like a lot of water end up being a casualty. So when farmers spray the plants every other day and it rains every other day, then the, the pesticides do not take. Rotating crops as often as possible using fungicides, as well as removing all plant remains at the end of the growing season, are some key measures to keep tomato blight at bay. So far, an infected neighboring farms have decided to risk a bad harvest and plant the tomatoes. Meanwhile, the Kenya Meteorological Department is predicting more rainfall at above average rates over the next few months. If this does happen, Cooking with tomatoes will become a luxury for many people in East Africa. Masi Juma, BBC News, Laikipia. Well, before we go, let's take a quick look at our top story on Focus on Africa. Algeria has confirmed its first case of coronavirus. The announcement comes as the head of the World Health Organization said the rise in cases around the world is deeply concerning, but said the virus can still be contain contained and does not amount to a pandemic. Now, in Algeria, the health ministry said on Tuesday that an Italian man who arrived in the country on February 17th had tested positive for the virus. Earlier this month, Egypt recorded a case. That man has now recovered. And don't forget, you can get in touch with me and the rest of the Focus on Africa team on social media. I'm Atsi Kenye. But for now, thanks for your company.